What would you think if you came across two worlds that orbited so closely together that their planet rise filled the sky of the other? Or a star which, as you grew closer, revealed itself to be two, almost touching? These are the kinds of worlds and moons that we come across all the time in science fiction, and even on the menu screen of Elite Dangerous, there's a moon with an SRV on it right next to a canyon-filled planet right in the background. So I wanted to know, are these kind of worlds possible? Are these places that we've found in space? Do we have evidence that they actually exist? And how close is too close for massive bodies like this? Let's find out using Universe Sandbox. Now we'll start off with not destroying planets and then we'll do the traditional universe sandbox thing and create some situations where planets would not get along so nicely. Now our two Marses are orbiting each other at around one diameter away from each other which is around um, three and a half thousand kilometers or two thousand miles and they look kind of normal right there's no obvious effect. These planets are intact. Now there are some interesting effects going on and we'll talk about those in a moment, but first let's go to another one of our close neighbours, uh, our very own Moon. Now ordinarily it's quite safe, it orbits the Earth at a significant distance, uh, on average about 384,000 kilometres or 238,000 miles. But in this simulation, we have another moon which starts its orbit out several diameters of the moon away. But this is a highly elliptical orbit, so although it starts slowly, it approaches very close to the other moon and accelerates as it makes that approach. So we're watching to see if there are any effects as that close approach happens. Is there something about that proximity that could break apart these close uh, twin moons, or will it survive? So at this part of the orbit, there's enough gravitational effect from the other moon to alter the course of the orbiting moon, and yet it's not enough to create any breaking apart of the material, there's no uh, visible heat that's coming through the surface. The moon survives this one. In Universe Sandbox, you can open these graphs on the right hand side and you can see internally the effects that the physics are having on the celestial bodies. And here you can see that there are terawatts of energy uh, created by the tidal forces within the moons. And yet this is still not enough. Even though we can see these forces taking their effect, it's not enough to have any structural effect on the moon, even at such a close approach as with this highly elliptical orbit. Okay, so for a bit of fun, let's put the moon a little bit closer here and restart the simulation and see what happens. Okay, I guess that was a little bit too close, but we made a very pretty moon. I'd say that's an improvement overall. <laughs> So we've seen that small bodies are quite stable, but we're also seeing that the shape of the orbit matters as well. And one of the reasons for this can be found in Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Now Kepler, writing 400 years ago, said in his first law of planetary motion that all orbits of celestial bodies are elliptical. Uh, it was previously thought that they were circular, but Kepler, through careful observation, worked out that this isn't true an orbit is always elliptical. Now, his second law states that if you were to draw an imaginary line between a celestial body and the primary that it's orbiting, it would sweep out equal areas of space for equal times. And what this illustrates is that when a celestial body is in the closest part of its orbit, it travels faster. And if it's a highly elliptical orbit, it travels much faster. And this increased velocity of course will create a huge amount of pushing and pulling inside the planet, kind of like a squash ball being hit against a wall repeatedly. And that's what you can see on this graph on the right hand side of the screen. These peaks are where the temperature inside the planet is at its highest because of the friction that's being produced by that force. 
Now things are about to get a whole lot weirder because yes this is uh, two Earths right next to each other. Uh, they've got a separation of about a diameter of Earth um, so that would be about 12 and a half thousand kilometers or just under 8,000 miles. And if you look carefully you'll see little clouds that are emanating from around both of the Earths and just as we saw with the forces pulling apart the surface of Mars those same forces as these two Earths orbit around each other are pulling the lighter elements away from the surface of Earth. And more than that, the heat caused by the close orbit of these two very heavy bodies is actually turning the liquid water on Earth into plasma, which is then evaporating from the surface of Earth. And you can see as the water all evaporates, the visible radiation, the infrared radiation from the Earth increases and that would not be a, a very nice place to live. However, it is still a planet. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. These are not completely pulled apart. They have been heated, yes, but they still have their essential structure. So I'm going to insist that we are not witnessing the destruction of two Earths here, but rather just the transition into two lava planets as they are further heated by their own tidal gravitational forces. Now let's do the whole thing again with an important difference. This is the same two versions of Earth at the same distance from each other. Now the important difference is that they are tidally locked. You'll notice that the continents are in synchronized motion and the effect of this, if you can imagine, if you were squeezing together a couple of balls, <laughs> if they were rolling together rather than pushing against each other, then there would be less friction going on and in fact that is what we see even though these two earths are heating they're not heating to the same extent and we can leave the simulation running and we'll find that we never get to the molten stage even though the rest of the conditions are exactly the same the temperature actually tops out at a balmy 220 degrees centigrade um, so that's extremely hot but it's not inconceivable that humans could build some kind of uh, heat transfer habitation and live on an earth just like this. However, we'd have to find a way of uh, getting some water once the oceans had all evaporated. So one more set of earths. Now these two earths are at a very special distance. They have a semi-major axis. That means the radius of their orbit is 24,000 kilometers and at this precise distance there is just enough heat produced by the friction inside these Earths to keep their temperature at about 30 degrees centigrade which is the temperature that we like Earth to be. Uh, so without a star in this simulation system these two Earths could remain just as they are by using the heat produced inside them uh, to radiate out through to the crust and keep water in liquid form. Now it takes a lot of energy to keep the Earth at 30 degrees centigrade and Universe Sandbox will have a go at guessing exactly how much energy is doing this in this simulation. And on these graphs on the right you can see that the fairly sustained frictional tidal energy produced by this system is 180 petawatts. And not coincidentally, the amount of energy received by the Earth from the Sun is estimated to be 174 petawatts. So this is why in this simulation these two Earths are able to keep their exact temperature. Because at this precise orbit the effect of the binary system in terms of tidal forces is precisely the same as the effect of the sun's radiation on the Earth as it is today. Tidal forces are amazing. So as one last treat I thought I'd show you uh, two Saturns, a gas giant with an icy ring on each. And the cool thing about seeing these up close, the orbit is three or four uh, of their diameters apart, when ice comes closest to the space between them, it actually sometimes transfers over and passes to the other set of rings. Now this is a subject for another day, but if you're interested 
look up the concept of a Roche lobe and Lagrangian points and uh, this is something that I want to explore in a later video. Another thing that I really wanted to get to was binary stars and the way that contact binaries um, can produce incredible effects. That is something that I'm going to have to explore another day. Thanks for joining me on this journey. I hope you've learned something and enjoyed the sights of our universe as imagined in Universe Sandbox 2. As ever, from my space time to yours, be excellent to each other and keep exploring.